Good evening, everyone, and welcome, sir. Thank you for joining us. I welcome you all to our lecture series. I'm Smriti. I'm a volunteer with the In Dialogue Foundation. Our guest for today is Ambassador K.P. Fabian. Ambassador Fabian served in the Indian Foreign Service from 1964 to 2000. He has served as ambassador to Finland, Qatar, and Italy from where he retired. In Rome, he was also the permanent representative to FAO, that is the Food and Agricultural Organization, and other UN organizations in Rome. As Joint Secretary Gulf, Ambassador Fabian was the coordinator for the evacuation from Kuwait and Iraq following the occupation of Kuwait by President Saddam Hussein in August 1990. His published books include Common Sense on War on Iraq, Diplomacy Indian Style, and India in the 21st Century. Currently, Ambassador Fabian is professor at Indian Society of International Law, New Delhi, and a distinguished fellow at Symbiosis University, Pune. His podcasts on current affairs are available on his website, that is ambassadorfabian.com slash podcasts. I welcome you, sir, and it's an honor to have you here with us. The topic of discussion for today is contribution of diplomacy in building up international peace and order. The lecture will continue for 45 minutes, and after that, the participants can ask their questions. They can keep typing in their questions in the chat box, and we can have a discussion on that. I will now request Sir to start, begin the conversation. Uh, thank you, Smriti, for that uh, very cordial introduction. Uh, an introduction which has uh, demonstrated that I am the youngest uh, in this gathering. Now, <laughs> dear uh, India Law Foundation, dear Secretary General Desad, ladies and gentlemen in India and the rest of the world, <laughs> it's a rare privilege and high honor to be with all of you. The foundation should be complimented for bringing together human minds for good purposes, for making a better world, for promoting justice and sanity. I listened to Dr. Merchants, uh, he's a good friend of mine, presentation last week. That was excellent. Now, to my friends in India, I can say good evening. To my friends in California, I will have to say good morning. And uh, maybe good afternoon to my friends in Syria. Now this pleasant dilemma of what to say reminds me of Finland where I was posted in the last millennium. Well, a Buddhist monk came there and we took him to the north of Finland to the summer. In the north of Finland, we have 720 hours of uninterrupted sunshine. I repeat, uninterrupted sunshine. So, the monk was asked to propose a toast and he said, I cannot say good morning because the sun has been sh shining, for so, shining for so long. Can you all hear me now? Hello, can you hear me? But yes, we can hear you, Ambassador. Thank you. Um, so the monk said, I can't say good morning because the sun has been shining for so long. I can't say good afternoon or good evening because it is the sun is going to shine for so many hours more. Then he paused and said, I can only say it is so good, so good to be with all of you. And that is what I want to say now. It is so good, so good to be with all of you. Now, today is uh, the birthday of Nelson Mandela. So let us start by saluting this great hero of our times who stood for, well, what shall we say? Human rights, freedom, sanity, justice. Now coming to our theme, which Smithy has uh, mentioned, 
Well, Socrates always insisted on, you know, clarity of concepts. And he also wanted definitions. Now, if you start with definitions, that will take a long time. We shall be sitting here till tomorrow morning. But let us start with some clarifications. Now, the three concepts are diplomacy, international peace, international order. Now, let's take the last one first, international order. Frankly, tell me, friends, don't we see more disorder than order in the international realm? In fact, we see disorder plus order. Take COVID-19. We have crossed the grim toll of uh, 600,000 human beings who have uh, died because of this. The total number of uh, infection is over 14 million. Now, the most important fact about it is that it could have been prevented. Let me explain. It occurred in China, Wuhan, mid-December, about 2019, and a young doctor, Dr. Li Wenlian, he went to the social media and raised an alarm. Then what happened? The mayor of Wuhan was very angry because he had plans for a series of big party meetings to be concluded with a banquet for 40,000 families. I repeat, 40,000 families on the 18th of January. So the mayor, he silenced and rebuked the young doctor who later, sometime in February, passed away because he also got infected. So what happened on the 18th of January? The banquet was held and the virus went viral. Beijing wakes up slowly, sends a virologist. Wuhan under lockdown by 22nd January. Question, suppose the mayor had acted more responsibly? Another question, if Beijing did not know, why it failed to know? On 31st December 2019, China communicates to WHO that there were instances of pneumonia of unknown etiology. And then China adds, there was no evidence so far of human to human transmission. Now, this was convoluted language because when you say there was no evidence, you are not saying that there is no human to human transmission. You are covering yourself with legalese. So, Beijing was at fault in not speaking clearly. Beijing should have said, we have not so far come across any such evidence, but we are on the lookout and we shall let you know. And what did the WHO do? It showed amazing lack of scientific temper. It swallowed hook, line and sinker what China said. Instead, WHO should have asked questions. WHO should have told the member states, look, this is what China has said, but we have to be alert. We have to find out whether there is human to human transmission. Let us work on it. And WHO should have got in touch with, uh, you know, centers of disease control and prevention in the United States and elsewhere and send a team to China. Well, 
WHO didn't do it. That is WHO's irresponsibility. 14th of January, WHO treated. There was no evidence of human to human transmission. That was absolutely atrocious. Because on the 13th of January in Thailand, there was a case. Now, could anyone in Thailand be infected unless there is human to human transmission? Then, on the 22nd of January, the emergency committee of the WHO met. It uh, met the second day, it was split down the middle. There were professionals who wanted to take profession decisions professionally. And then there were others who wanted to please China. And can you imagine? The emergency committee decided to meet 10 days later. That is, the emergency committee was so sure that the virus will wait for the committee to meet again. Well, the director general had second thoughts. He went to Beijing and he came back. The committee met and a public health emergency of international concern was declared, I think, on the 30th of January. Then again, WHO waits and waits. It puts to shame the snail because only by March 11th, the pandemic was declared. By that time, 4,291 human beings had died. There were 118,000 cases of infection in 114 countries. In short, the WHO declared a pandemic days, stroke weeks after the pandemic had occurred. Question, is there any rule that WHO should wait for the death toll to exceed 4,000? and the number of infected countries to exceed uh, 100? International order impl implies that states and international organizations act responsibly. China and WHO acted irresponsibly. There, were, there are others too who have acted irresponsibly. In fact, uh, I would say that uh, COVID 19 came to the world in 2020, the world led by leaders with a few honorable exceptions, led by leaders who lack 2020 vision. Well, when it was happening in China, how did the rest of the world look at it? Sandra Samba, Under Secretary of Health Italy, she said, well, when it was happening in China, we thought, well, some science fiction movie that had nothing to do with us in Italy or in Europe. And when the virus came to Italy and exploded, Europe looked the same way we looked at China. I repeat, Europe looked at the same way on Italy, at Italy, the way Europe, uh, Italy had looked at China. Now, the latest I have is that uh, the European Union is uh, still not able to decide on a uh, amount of about 750 billion euro to help uh, the economically weaker member states to face the coronavirus crisis. Okay, now what we have to understand is that viruses, earthquakes, pollution, tsunamis, they do not respect state boundaries. They are reminding us that we are on a small boat in the ocean of space, or rather space-time. We have to swim together or sink together. Swimming together, helping each other, that is good international order. 
my country first is a recipe for disorder and disaster that reminds one of thomas hobbes who said bellum omnium contra omnius war of all against all the state of nature hope said where life is solitary poor nasty brutish and short now that reminds me of a joke by amartya sen he told me once in rome he had come to uh, give a lecture at the fao he said that as students they used to paraphrase hobbes and say that life in british india was solitary poor nasty british and short okay now the second concept is international peace some people <clears throat> circulate a simplified history there was a second world war there has not been a third world war there was only a cold war so we have had peace in a manner of speaking now the word cold war expression cold war is a horrendous misnomer during the so called cold war how many hot wars occurred korea vietnam i can name more millions were killed now i just want to make a point about the korean war which started in 1950 june and diplomacy in particular jawaharlal nehru's diplomacy as i said the war started when north korea invaded south korea sometime in june 1950 initially the north koreans were able to sort of you know have an easy walk over but later macarthur came and he stopped the north korean progress and he started advancing north and he had we are talking about well october eh? he had told president truman that according to his intelligence sources it would be possible for macarthur to free north korea by christmas time christmas 1950 Well, sometime in October, Indian Ambassador K. M. Panikkar in Peking at that time, eh? they started calling it Beijing much later, was woken up at night around midnight by Prime Minister Chu Enlai, and they had a meeting, and Chu Enlai told Panikkar. to tell nehru please tell truman that if macarthur doesn't stop then the pla people's liberation army will enter nehru conveyed it to truman he was ridiculed the new york times said ah here is nehru he is a dreamer he doesn't understand the realities of politics well truman went by the assurance given by macarthur now 3 years later more than 3 million deaths later that includes about 55000 american soldiers the ceasefire was on the same 38th parallel that divided north korea from south korea so my question is who was the realist nehru or truman question how many human beings have been killed in wars and civil wars since 1945 not many scholars are interested but milton lightenberg he has studied this and in his uh, essay deaths in wars and conflicts 
in the 20th century, he has computed that between 1945 and 2000, 41 million human beings were killed. Now, I've not seen any calculation for 2000 to 2020. All that I can say is that 21st century seems to be even more, what shall I say? Um, you know, it's, it's 25, 21st century shows man can be cruel to his own fellow beings, even in a more terrible way. Now, how much does the world spend on waging war and keeping in readiness for war? Short answer, too much. If war is defined as an active conflict that, clay, that claims more than 1,000 lives, during the past 3,400 years, humans have been entirely at peace only for 268 years. At least 108 million people were killed in the 20th century. The combined armed forces of the world amount to more than 21 million. China, the largest, 2.4 million. America, 1.4. India, 1.3. North Korea, 1 million. Russia, 900,000. Of the world's 20 largest militaries, 14 are in developing countries. From 1940 to 1996, a period that included several cycles of war and peace, including the arms race for the Cold War, America spent $16.23 trillion on the military, out of which $5.82 trillion on nuclear weapons alone. Okay. That is, you know, what has happened and what is happening. Now, the third concept is diplomacy. Now, there can be two types of diplomacy. One is what, let's call it ideal diplomacy. That is the art of negotiation between states to resolve disputes peacefully on the basis of give and take. The second variety is actual diplomacy. Actual meaning prevailing diplomacy. Take care of the perceived interests of the state with or without threatening war. Now I said perceived interest deliberately because textbooks in political science speak of national interest. National interest determines foreign policy. That's what the textbooks say. Well, uh, let's take one example from history. Japan invaded China in 1931. Japan wanted a co-prosperity sphere in East Asia dominated by it. The Japanese people supported it. It was a national interest at that time. And then what happened? It ended in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Was it in the interest of the Japanese people or of the ruling elite? Or did not the ruling elite get it all wrong. In brief, the ruling elite was able to fool the people. Let's face it, governments make mistakes. The famous author Barbara Tuchman, who wrote <coughs> The March of Folly, she says, a phenomenon noticeable throughout history 
regardless of place or period, is pursued by governments of policies contrary to their own interests. If you want an example, when Trump said, oh, coronavirus, that's like common cold. He was pursuing a policy against America's interest. That was much of folly. Now, coming back to diplomacy proper, the UN is the most significant achievement of diplomacy. The preamble to the UN Charter, I'll just uh, read out uh, the first few lines because you know it very well, but just to recall, we, the peoples of the United Nations, de determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind, and to reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women and of nations large and small and to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained and to promote social progress and better standards of life in larger freedom and so on. Well, Question, has the UN delivered? Now, I want to make one thing clear. UN is only a forum. So if the UN has not delivered, the fault lies not with UN per se, but with the member states. Eh? Okay, now to go back to the question, has the UN delivered? Yes and no. Let's look at the UN in three parts. We have the Security Council, we have the Secretary General and his office, that is the second part, and the third part is ECOSOC, Economic and Social Council, and specialized agencies. The Security Council, the most important, the most powerful organ of the United Nations has signally failed. What did the Security Council do about the Korean War? What did you do about the Vietnam War? Incidentally, why call it Vietnam War? Did Vietnam go and attack the United States? It should be called the War on Vietnam. Anyway, as Confucius said, it's important, you know, to get uh, called things by their correct names. So the Security Council has rarely carried out its duty to preserve peace and security. But let me mention one example, East Timor, that's a success story. Another success story, well, I will qualify that, that is the Iran-Iraq war of the 1980s. Both countries agreed to a ceasefire <coughs> according to a resolution drafted, uh, approved by the Security Council. But there is a deeper explanation. What happened was that uh, United States shot down a civilian Iranian flight, killing 290 people. That was done by USSS Vincennes. That was on the 3rd of July, 1988. By 20th July, the Security Council resolution was adopted. That is because Iran realized that uh, while it can fight Iraq, it cannot fight Iraq and the United States at the same time. <coughs> now, Iran went to the Security Council asking it to condemn the US action of shooting down a civilian airplane. U.S. defended its action as an act of war. Why? Wrong argument. The United States was, had not declared war on Iran, on Iran. USSR asked 
the United States to withdraw its forces from the area. Now, there are 13 other members in the Security Council. They either kept quiet or supported the United States. Let's take it further. Iran went to the ICJ, International Court of Justice, and eight years later, in 1996, there was a settlement between Iran and the United States, and the United States agreed to pay an amount of uh, US dollar, 61.8 million. Now, ICJ did not deliver full justice, but partial justice. Okay, now let's look at the role of the Secretary General. Well, he has his uh, special envoys, and they have done great work for conflict resolution. You take Yemen, where the special representative of the Secretary General uh, brokered a very long all-party conference resulting in the drafting of a constitution. And on Syria, Kofi Annan and others did great work, but they all failed. We don't have time to go into details, but all that I want to say is that if they failed, it's not because they were not good. It's not because of any want of effort on their part. You know, as the saying goes, you can take the horse to the stream, but you cannot make it drink. Now on Syria, I just want to make a point. Conferences after conferences have been held in Geneva and elsewhere. Kofi Annan took a lot of trouble. Then why did he fail? He failed because the powers that were attending these conferences, while they spoke about peace, at the same time, they were pouring in weapons. In other words, Syria was in flames, and these powers were pouring oil over the fire in support of their particular side, whether the side of uh, Bashar al-Assad, the president, or a free Syrian army, or some other side. So, you know, it was uh, absolutely self-contradictory. Now, the third part of the UN system. Uh, the ECOSOC and specialized agencies. They do a lot of good. You all have heard about the <clears throat> Sustainable Development Goals, UNICEF, UNESCO. They do a lot of other sorts of tremendous good work. Now, I want to mention something about sanctions, genocidal sanctions. I'm choosing my adjective carefully. Genocidal sanctions against Iraq imposed with Security Council, led by the United States. So let's see. One part of the UN was doing its worst to, well, let me use plain English, to kill the people of Iraq. Because if you don't eat, if you don't get medicine when you are sick, you will eventually die. And UNICEF had calculated that 500,000 children had died because of the sanctions. Madeleine Albright, at that time, United States permanent representative to the United Nations, was asked in a famous or infamous television interview, was it the right price to pay? And she said, yes, it was, that was the right price. And what was it for? for? to make sure that Saddam Hussein declare and surrender all the weapons of mass destruction that he had. Incidentally, weapons of mass destruction, WMD, 
That was an expression coined by Jawaharlal Nehru. But eventually, after Saddam Hussein's overthrow, United States spent hundreds of millions of dollars looking for WMD and they couldn't find anything. I have said in my book, Common Sense on War on Iraq, that the correct expansion of WMDs, weapons of mass deception. I had gone to Baghdad when Baghdad was uh, uh, under sanctions and I attended uh, a cocktails reception and uh, a young lady from Germany came and spoke to me and uh, she said that uh, she had just come back from a remote place and uh, she had gone there to check whether 18 syringes which were imported by Ir Iraq and which were sent to that particular probably hospital in that small town. She had gone there to check whether they were used for the declared purpose. She laughed, saying that it didn't make any sense for her to go all the way. Then she added, she felt rather guilty because she had earned $100 for making that trip, day long trip. Well, I appreciated her sentiments and told her that uh, the school teacher in Baghdad was getting $3 a month. Now, what is poignant is that the $3 for the school teacher and the $100 to my good friend who was having a drink with me, both came from Iraq's funds, which Iraq got for selling oil. So, now, let me ask a question. We call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens. Sapienza means wisdom. So we say or we claim that we are wise twice, wise squared. All right. That is one way of looking at it. But sometime back. Seneca the younger said, what fools these mortals be? Well, that's also true. In fact, both are true. You know, on the one hand, there is a lot of sapiens, wisdom in human beings. But on the other hand, they act foolishly, often. It's like this, as Plato said, in our soul, there are three parts, the rational part, then the appetites, and in between, honor, dignity, and all that. Now, all the three parts are important, but, and they should work in harmony, but, the rational part should be in control. Now that is not always the case. I think I will slowly wind up because I'm very eager to listen to the questions because I have come here to be with you, to have a conversation, not to sort of uh, give a lecture. I just shared some thoughts, but I'll be very glad to be what shall I say, to be refuted. You know, anything which I have said, if anyone wishes to, uh, you know, give arguments against my thoughts, always welcome. That is what is called a real symposium. Now, the last thought is, the state is not to be worshipped. It is a human device 
to serve human beings the rest of life, you know, in the great chain of being and the life supporting environment. That is what the state is meant for. It's a human device and it is not to be worshipped. Thank you for listening to me with such uh, gracious patience. Thank you, sir. It was indeed an insightful session for us. And uh, you were able to give us clarity, as you said, in concepts through both your theoretical as well as practical experiences. I will now jump to the questions. Uh, the first question is from Alia. So she asks, what can a lay person learn about everyday cultures of peace building from years of experience of a distinguished diplomat service like you? Yeah, do I take a few questions for answer one by one? As you, as you wish. Yeah, okay. Can you repeat the question? I'll do that straight away. Can you repeat okay. the question? Yeah, the question is, uh, what can a lay person learn about everyday cultures of peace building from years of experience of a distinguished diplomat service like you? Thank you. Thank you for the question. You know, it's like this. Uh, I made a distinction between uh, ideal diplomacy and uh, uh, actual diplomacy or prevailing diplomacy. And I want to expand on that. You know, in, the U in Geneva, there's a disarmament commission. It meets from time to time. So one might think that all the ambassadors uh, accredited to that commission, that UN commission for disarmament are wedded to the concept of disarmament. Well, frankly, they are not. I have spoken to many of them and many of them did not want any disarmament at all. So I think what happens is that, you know, a diplomat is supposed to take care of the interests of his country. And now comes a question, whether you can take care of the interests and neglect adherence to principles. Now, my answer to that is that it is possible to take care of your interests and adhere to the principles at the same time. Because if you do not adhere to the principles, then over the long term, your interests will be harmed. After all, we all want peace. We all want economic development. We do not want, uh, you know, wars. You know, only people who benefit from wars are merchants of death, the military industrial complex, not only in the United States, but elsewhere also. So, uh, but um, let me put it this way. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we diplomats do succeed uh, in, uh, in resolving conflicts, and, uh, but uh, that's not always the case. The next question is from Anusha. So she asks, from what I understand of diplomacy, diplomacy of any country should be to promote peace and harmony. But with the current scenario of Sino-India border disputes and Indian government's response to it, are we heading in the right direction or could we do anything different? What do you think according to your experience, sir? Thank you. Very important question. Uh... Well, I wouldn't say that uh, we can truthfully say that diplomats always promote peace and harmony. They should, but they don't. But uh, coming to what's happening between India and China at the border, as I see it, uh, starting from the first week or so of April, China advanced. You see, there is the so-called line of actual control between India and China. Now, frankly, between you and me, the line of actual control doesn't make any sense at all. Because in 1993, when Prime Minister Narasimha Rao, Narasimha Rao was in Beijing, he signed an agreement for maintaining peace and tranquility along the LAC. Good idea. But with that agreement, there was no map I repeat, there was no map which indicated what the LAC was. So it was a very vague concept, you know, undefined and not at all on any paper. 
So the two parties had no idea where the LAC was, but they just used the expression. In fact, in the 1950s, when Chuan Lai proposed, uh, uh, you know, negotiations on the basis of LAC, actual control, Nehru had rejected it. Now, what Narasim Rao should have done was to have a map. Without a map, it didn't make any sense. Now, what the Chinese have been doing is that from time to time, they try to advance. So, suppose they advance 10 kilometers. Well, then, you know, after a while, the two parties agree to disengage. Then the Chinese uh, withdraw by two kilometers. And India also has to withdraw by two kilometers. So don't forget, they had already advanced 10 kilometers and they are withdrawing only two kilometers. In other words, they have gained eight kilometers. You know, now this is their goal. That is what they are trying to do. Now, it is uh, India's duty to prevent them from doing it. And for that, uh, uh, the Indian military should stand up to the Chinese at the border. Because if you do not stand up, you cannot gain at the conference table, diplomatic, level or political level, what you have lost uh, at the, on, in the field, you know? Now, this is an ongoing thing, so I don't want to say what exactly is happening, but it seems Chinese have succeeded to an extent in making us uh, agree to mutual withdrawal. Because mutual withdrawal makes sense only when both parties have intruded. When India has intruded in the Chinese side, and China has intruded into India's side, well, then there should be mutual withdrawal. When only China has intruded, the withdrawal should not be mutual. That is, we should have the restoration of status quo ante. Now that uh, status quo ante, those three words, I have not seen from India's official spokesperson for the last couple of days. On the 16th of June, MEA said it, but I have not seen that repeated since then. Let's hope it will come back. So, uh, the next question is, how relevant is the UN Security Council in current times of rising dictatorships such as China and Korea? Well, the UN Security Council has got uh, P5. That is a permanent fight. Now, the Security Council cannot take any decision which is vetoed, opposed by one of the P5. I just want to go back in time. You see, the Second World War was raging. By 1941, President Roosevelt of the United States had come to the conclusion that uh, the League of Nations can, should not be revived and that we needed a new organization. And Roosevelt told himself that, look, in the global village, we need four policemen to keep peace. So his policemen were US, USSR, uh, UK, and China. China because Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of China, had high international standing at that time. We're talking about 43, 44. India was not in the reckoning because, uh, you know, India was not independent. Then what happened? Stalin said, China, an Asiatic power in sitting judgment over us Europeans? Well, Stalin agreed reluctantly. Churchill, he was very smart. He said he can't agree to China unless Roosevelt agreed to France. France was under German occupation at that time. But then Roosevelt agreed, and that is how the P5 came, you know. Now that perhaps, I repeat the word perhaps, was a good arrangement in 1945, but it's a very bad arrangement in 2020. And then, whether a country is democratic or dictatorial does not make much difference. As I said earlier, it was democratic United States which imposed genocidal sanctions on Iraq. 
Okay. Now what is happening is that uh, China is a rising power. America had been declining, but uh, you know it started from such a high height that uh, China will take a long, long, long time if it ever, if it ever reaches the same level as the United States. Uh, so uh, I think uh, countries, uh, uh, the United, the Security Council will not be able to carry out its responsibilities unless this. Uh, what shall I say, anachronic system of uh, veto holding P5, that system is uh, remodeled. Uh, sir, I'll move on to the other question. So Dr. Rastogi, he says, it is written in the newspaper columns that after this pandemic passes, the world is likely to welcome more authoritarian regimes in different parts of the world. So they ask, do you agree? And they thank you so uh, thank you for uh, thank you and the In Dialogue Foundation for letting us hear from a very resourceful personality. Well, thank you for the question of uh, Dr. Rastogi. Uh, unfortunately, you know the signs are that uh, the pandemic, uh, in a way, enables regimes to be more authoritarian. I'll tell you one country in North, America, North Africa, Algeria, where there is a dissident and a political dissident. Now, just to make sure that everybody abides by the lockdown, they have to put two policemen <laughs> in front of this guy's house. Not to make sure that, you know, he doesn't go out and uh, mingle just to make sure that he doesn't, I mean, uh, endangering others, just to make sure that he doesn't go out, you know, to carry out any political propaganda against the government. And uh, there are signs of that sort of uh, authoritarianism. You can see that in, uh, in uh, 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 Hungary, you can see that in, uh, uh, in Poland uh, and all that. So that is there. That is there, but uh, I doubt whether it is going to be an enduring trend. I think eventually, when um, you know we get over this uh, terrible thing, I think uh, uh, the democratic forces will be able to assert themselves. But we are going through that phase. Maybe such is also a realization for uh, acceptance of the welfare state more than an authoritarian state. There is another comment, and they say uh, that diplomacy is another term for pot and kettle politics. Every country is guilty of crimes on humanity. Nobody wants to admit. So the never-ending cycle of pinning it on one another. This is a comment if you would want to say something on it. Well, uh, crimes against humanity. You know, let's look at it this way. 1948. Uh, you know, there was a convention against genocide. There was human rights convention, all that. But you know, it is the states that are party to these conventions, which, has, which have been often guilty of committing genocide or violating human rights. Just because a state has signed and even ratified a UN treaty or convention, it doesn't follow that its behavior is in tune with that treaty. In fact, the state that uh, ratifies a treaty is supposed to uh, uh, start legislation, domestic legislation, you know, to bring its laws uh, in harmony with the international treaty and all that. Very seldom they do that. So we have a problem, and many states have been guilty of committing crimes against humanity. But I think uh, the real remedy is, uh, you know, democracies should be able to correct themselves. And uh, let me tell you that Rwanda, you know, the genocide, was it 1993, I think, roughly? Well, uh, Clinton, you know, was president. He didn't want to do anything about it. Now, years later, after he left office, he has regretted that. 
So people do realize their mistakes. But when an American president realizes his mistake after he leaves the White House, well, it doesn't make any difference to the state of mankind. Uh, so the final question here is similar to something that you've already spoken about in one of the questions on the Security Council, but I will still read it out. So Zaman Tahir asks, Sir, what do you think? Is it possible that this pandemic will have an effect on global interconnectedness? And what do you think that, in quotes, that world is bigger than five in the matter of veto power? Is it right to reconsider it? Okay, thank you. Uh, well, the pandemic so European member states of the European Union sort of, you know, closing their borders. But that I don't treat as a negative development because even in India, we closed, the states closed their borders. You know, it was a, an administrative step necessary. Um, but uh, what is more worrying is that, as I said earlier, when it happened to Italy, and Italy sought uh, help from European Union, it got nothing. You know, there was a certain uh, isolation, parochialism. Not interested in what is happening to others. I'm only interested in what is happening to me. America first, me first, UK first. You know, that sort of thing, you know. So that uh, trend, the pandemic, unfortunately, has um, promoted. But that also, I hope and pray, will be reversed in due course. Now, coming to, but on the other hand, I also want to say that the so-called globalization has, uh, what shall I say, uh, has gone in the wrong direction. We need globalization, but we need uh, a saner globalization. Because now what is globalization? Goods and money can travel free, not human beings. Not good ideas, even. Okay? So, globalization has to be corrected. Hmm? Um, and also, I don't believe that it's a good idea. You know, we all have printers. We don't want the same country to be making all six out of six printers. If all the printers which we use come from the same country, no, that is a bit of a monopoly. That's not good. It's not healthy. So that should be corrected. As regards the P5, let me put it this way. P5 will never agree to make it P7, P8, or P11. When they want India's goodwill, when they want to send, uh, sell some weapons to India, then they will come to India and make a statement. We believe India should be in the Security Council as a permanent member, but they don't mean it. They are making the statement only to please us, only to go get through the deal. They are determined to keep it that way. Now, what I would like to see, this is very important, I would like to see the General Assembly pass a resolution. All of them, minus P5. If P5 want to join, it's okay. But the General Assembly, minus P5, to pass a resolution, we should say that instead of P5, we need a P10. Okay? Without specifying which country should it be. And that the you know, P6, P7, P8, P9, P10 should be chosen by the General Assembly on the basis of each country getting four-fifths votes, you know, that sort of thing. Now then, let all these countries ratify that amendment and P5 are left alone, isolated. Then they might be sh shamed into doing something about it. But if we start by saying that India should be there, Brazil should be there, Japan should be there, Germany should be there, it is a non-starter because the other countries will oppose it. Thank you. For that matter, even if we look at globalization in terms of the transfer of goods and services, even then, uh, I remember reading somewhere that the export and import of goods are actually in similar quantities. 
So the amount of goods that we export and import are actually same in quantities and same in the quality. So even then, the globalizing, the transfer of uh, goods and services does Hello. I lost you for a while. Yeah, sorry, I'll just repeat. I was saying that uh, I read somewhere that uh, the goods that are imported and exported out of our country are actually similar quantities and in a similar quality. So the goods we are importing are actually the same as we export. So do you think then this trade, does it make sense? Uh, first of all, I beg to disagree with your first proposition that the goods that we export and the goods that we import are similar in quality. Take our trade with China. We are selling China raw materials. And from China, we are importing, of course, we import Ganesha and fireworks and all that. But we also import high-end electrical goods IT and all that. Okay, so it is not the case that uh, the quality of goods imported and exported is roughly the same. If you look at the trade between the countries, the North, the developed countries, you know, they sell more refined products and they buy raw materials from the South. I mean, this is the grosso modo. <coughs> okay. Second thing is, even the European Union, you know, our prime minister had a meeting with uh, the European Union, a summit meeting. Now they want to have uh, a broad trade and investment treaty. Now, one of the things uh, in the way is that they do not want to give us a fair treatment in regard to export of pharmaceuticals, from India to the EU. In other words, when they speak of uh, free trade and all that, they don't really mean it. You know, it's all rhetoric. You know, and uh, another thing is that uh, even in regard to, you know, personnel, you know, there are visa systems, and you know what uh, Trump did with H1B visa and all that. You see, an Indian uh, uh, technically qualified person, he cannot just go and work in France or somewhere else. You know what I mean? So only goods and money are moving. In fact, money is moving at a fantastic pace. You know, with a click, you can transfer millions. You know, arbitrage. People are making money and all that. You know, by changing dollars into Japanese yen and the other way around and all that. All that is happening. But actual movement of persons, that's not happening. There are restrictions. And in regard to goods also, there are restrictions. You see? And also GSP and all that, generalized signal preferences, which now United States has taken it away from India. You know, these things are happening. So we need a trade system which is free and fair. You know, it should be fair. Now that fairness is lacking. So there's one final question. Um, what happens if any state doesn't abide by the conventions that they have signed with the UN, other than the Security Council questioning and asking for reports? Well, in some cases, you can take them to the ICG, International Court of Justice. And if they do not abide by the you know, verdict of the International Court of Justice, it can be taken to the Security Council. But the only problem is that, you know, I told you about the five policemen. In the global village, there can be peace if the policemen are not involved in any crimes, if they are not supporting any of the criminals. But in the village where the policemen themselves are either committing crimes, whether it is Syria, whether it is uh, Yemen, America by selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, 
weapons which are used to bomb hospitals, schools, weddings, and even funerals. Okay, so when the policemen themselves are creating, committing crimes, or have linkages with those who are committing crimes, what can we do? So there are no other questions now, but it was a very interesting session for sure. And uh, I would now take the opportunity on behalf of the In Dialogue Foundation to thank you for your time, thank you for the insights, and thanking the participants for being uh, active attendees here. And this, uh, this lecture has been recorded and it will be uploaded on our YouTube channel, which is the In Dialogue Foundation. You can watch it again and subscribe to our channel as well. Finally, we'll be back with another session next Saturday, 6 p.m. I hope to see all of you there and thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Smithy. I have enjoyed every moment and I thank the foundation, especially the Secretary General. And I'm so glad that I could just speak to you know, exchange views with so many of you and all the very best to all of you.